Welcome to the Lessons from Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Brian Beckham. Hey, before we get into the next episode, do me a favor, if you don't mind, like, share, comment, rate the podcast on YouTube or whatever podcatcher you use. The reason I ask you to do that is because the algorithms really like it when people interact with the podcast, and the more people interact with it, the higher it goes in the rankings, which means the more people will listen to it and the more guests I can get. I don't get paid for this, and neither do my guests, so I would really appreciate it if you like the show, if you like the guest and what they're saying, to give it a like, a share, a rating, stuff like that. My next guest is the commander of the 57th Operations Group and Close Air Support Integration Group, 57th Wing, Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. I'm talking about Colonel John B. Gallimore. Colonel Gallimore is an American war hero. He has flown F-16s and multiple tours of combat. He was also a Thunderbirds pilot, which is the Air Force unit that performs air shows that basically show what the capabilities of our different aircraft are. They're literally flying 550 knots, 18 inches apart in formation. I mean, some of the things that Thunderbirds do just absolutely blow your mind. Colonel Gallimore comes from a, a family of military folks. As a matter of fact, his dad was a combat pilot in Vietnam. And although his dad passed away between the summer of Colonel Gallimore's senior year in high school and freshman year of college, John uh, talks a lot about how his dad was his hero and how he wanted to follow in his footsteps, which is exactly what Colonel Gallimore did. Colonel Gallimore is just absolutely dripping with leadership. I mean, he's got leadership coming out of his pores. It is incredible to listen to the way Colonel Gallimore thinks about positive leadership, servant-based leadership, how he motivates his the people that work with and under him. He's got a lot of great thoughts, and we talk about this a lot kind of near the end of the podcast about trusting your instincts, patient leadership, being patient when you're a leader, and a lot of other things, testing yourself, pushing yourself, having a purpose. I mean, it's just, it's like a master class in leadership listening to Colonel Gallimore. I was absolutely blown away. There were multiple times where I actually got chills down my spine because I just could not believe how great some of the comments and some of the thoughts Colonel Gallimore has. If you're a fan of Top Gun like I was, this is literally that guy. He is the best of the best. And he's the kind of person that makes you really, frankly, makes me really comforted to know that these are the leaders that are protecting our country. With leaders like Colonel Gallimore, we're in good shape. So Colonel Gallimore and I had a very wide-ranging conversation. We talked a lot about how he became a fighter pilot. We talked a lot about the Thunderbirds, his ideas about leadership, talked a little bit about drone technology and AI and other things. It's just a wide-ranging and fascinating conversation from an absolutely fascinating individual. I know you're going to love this one. I know you're going to get a lot out of this one. And now I give you Colonel John B. Gallimore. Hey, everybody. Brian Beckham here. And I've got Colonel John B. Gallimer. Colonel Gallimer, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, Brian. How are you? It's great to see you. I'm doing, I'm doing really well. I got to tell you, Colonel, I am as excited about this podcast as I've been about any podcast for a bunch of reasons, one of which is when I was a young boy, it was my dream to be a pilot like you. And so I want to ask you about a bunch of stuff as it relates to being a fighter pilot in the military, uh, and in particular, being a Thunderbirds pilot, which I think is, is just the coolest thing I can possibly imagine. But, you know, before we get into that, Colonel Gallimore, how the heck you doing, man? I'm doing good, Brian. I mean, it is uh, kind of goes without saying that we are living in some challenging times right now with COVID and everything else that's going on. But I think, uh, you know, given the circumstances, things are about as good as they can possibly be. I mean, I'm, I'm living the dream, flying an F-16 for a living and uh, out in uh, Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. So uh, things are, I'm in a good place right now, my friend. I'm in a good place. For those of us who grew up with Top Gun or with aspirations to be a pilot, I cannot imagine a cooler job. But Colonel, you know, one of the reasons that I started this podcast was I really wanted to feature national leaders, particularly positive, inspirational leaders. And, you know, you, you've been a leader 
essentially your entire life. I mean, you were an Eagle Scout, then you were a leader in the Corps of Cadets at A&M, then you were in the military, and you've been a leader basically your entire adult life. So I want to ask you a question kind of right out of the gates, and that is, where do you think that your your passion, your drive to succeed, your drive to be a leader, where, where does that come from for you fundamentally? Brian, for me, uh, I, I was really fortunate. My dad was also a fighter pilot and I, you know, similar to your dad, he was at the very end of his career uh, and then retired from the military. And he instilled in me um, just a sense of purpose and a sense of leading a life that uh, is purpose driven that is based on a strict code of ethics and morals. And really I, I, you know, some kids, they're heroes when we were growing up or, you know, basketball players or baseball players or football players, you name it. But for me, my hero was my dad. Um, Really who I am today, I trace all the way back to how he raised me uh, as a young man. Um, You know, and unfortunately he passed away right before I went to Texas A&M. So the summer in between my, senior year in high school, my freshman year in college, my, my father passed away, but um, I credit him, you know, and then obviously my mom too, because it takes more than one individual there who really um, fostered in me this, this drive and this, what I would call a purpose driven life. My dad will wake up every day and say, each day is a day in which to excel. You know, and my mom and I still joke about, he had all these little sayings and colloquialisms, very similar to Will Jenkins, who we both know. Sure. Um, you know, and, but yeah, that was my dad. Every day was a day in which to excel and a new day in which to excel. And so I really, I've, I've used that as kind of my guiding light, if you will, throughout my life. And um, it's worked out so far. John uh, or Colonel, I'm sorry. I, I, I may occasionally slip back and forth. I hope that's okay. But uh, Colonel, you know, my, I, I, I'm the same exact way. My dad has always been my hero, uh, primarily because he raised me and my younger brother and my adopted older brother is a single father. My mom died when I was 10. My dad was, I think, a major in the Air Force at the time. And he essentially had to set his career aside a little bit. He, he, in other words, he could, there were certain things in the military that he could not do because it would take him away from his two boys too long. So he raised us while also serving in the military uh, for 20 years. And so he's always been my hero too, and, and given me a lot of lessons. But you know, your dad was a—you uh, you literally followed in his footsteps. I mean, he was a combat pilot in Vietnam. What, what kind of planes did he fly over there? He did. So he was significantly older, Brian. So he was actually in uh, the Korean War and flew the F-86s uh, at the very end of the Korean War, and then he did two tours in Vietnam as an OV-10 pilot, which the primary mission set of that aircraft was the uh, Ford Air Controller mission and uh, calling in the close air support strikes from the fast movers, if you will. And so um, when they were um, there in the initial stages of Vietnam, and then as it continued to mature, they were taking older, more experienced uh, combat aviators from like the Korean War, et cetera, and putting them in the OV-10, um, and it, which was the predecessor to today's A-10 Thunderbolt, the tank killer. Um, but yeah, so really unique um, opportunity. There's so many things that I'd love to go back and ask him now, you know, yeah. now that I know about fighter aviation and flying and having been in combat, et cetera, there's so many questions that I would love to go back and ask him and, you know, probably some similar experiences that he had that nobody else in the family could necessarily relate to, but um, you know, I could, and, and I don't know, and, and, and I, maybe my family's a little bit unique, but my brother-in-law is also was a fighter pilot. He was an F-15 C model driver. And then my wow. dad's brother was also a Marine Corps fighter pilot. Um, and so I don't know, just a unique, we have a lot of aviators in my family. Yeah. Um, so I guess there was, once I decided I didn't want to be a garbage man, then, um, you know, <laughs> dad's flying planes a little bit cooler than riding in the back of a garbage truck. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and here I am. So well, you know, it's almost like the family business is flying fighter jets. I mean, yeah, really, yeah, I, what, what, what a cool family business. Well, you, you know, Colonel, when I was born, my dad was actually stationed. My dad was a, a SAC Strategic Air Command, uh, uh, Bay 52 Navigator and Bombardier. He flew 200 combat missions over Vietnam, but he was actually stationed on the Guam Islands flying combat sorties. I don't know if that's the right term, combat missions over mm-hmm. Vietnam when I was born. So I didn't even see my father 
until I was six months old. But one of the, one of the neat stories, I, I have a little bit of a similar story kind of in that my mother was also in the Air Force. She was a nurse. My grandfather was in the Army Air Corps and then it became the Air Force. So he was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force. And then my mom's brother was a Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force and he worked in Air Force Intelligence. And when my dad was flying missions, this is super cool over Vietnam, my uncle knew when he returned safely and he would write letters or call my mother and say, hey, Ed got home safely. And I've actually got copies of those, some of those letters. It's really incredible to look back on and to imagine, you know, what it was like. And, and you served, uh, you've served multiple combat tours uh, as a fighter pilot. And I, and I want to hear a little bit about that. But before we get into some of your military experience, uh, some, some of your pilot experience, some of the Thunderbird experience, do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, where you come from, uh, a little bit about your background so people can get to know you a little bit better? Sure, Brian. So, you know, I was originally born in Louisiana and then uh, my family got to Texas as fast as they could. Can so, I interrupt you just real quick? Were you, did you happen to be born at uh, Barksdale Air Force Base? <laughs> I was actually born in Bossier City. Yeah, I was born in Bossier City, too. I was born in Barksdale Air Force Base. Wow, what a small world. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, sorry to interrupt you. That's that's nope. super neat, though. That's super neat. Yeah, yeah no, so, uh, yeah, my family, you know, they relocated to Texas. And uh, so I did two years at Spring High School there just outside of uh, Houston. And then my last two years, my junior and senior year at Conroe High School. And uh, as you alluded to earlier, uh, I was a Boy Scout. And then I finished that uh, pretty early in my high school career. Not then, just a Boy Scout, you were an Eagle Scout. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I did that and then um, transitioned to athletics. I think like, you know, most folks do uh, as you get a little bit older and, um, you know, played football and ran some track. And um, other than that, just had a good time. And, um, you know, as I was getting towards the end of my junior year and into my senior year in high school, my dad had always talked about Texas A&M and I really didn't have much SA, but when my dad was first in the air force, he was an instructor pilot out at old Brian airfield there. Sure. And at the time the core was so big that uh, the freshman cadets lived out at Brian airfield. And my dad talked about how respectful the cadets were because they would hitchhike into town. And my dad and his fighter pilot buddies would like, you know, take them into, into Brian so they could go to the bar and do whatnot. <laughs> so nice. that was kind of my introduction to Texas A&M. And then I went to spend the night with a core and, um, you know, the rest is, the rest is history, but that was, you know, that was kind of my high school adventure, if you will, was, uh, you know, like I said, the Eagle Scouts and then the athletics and then was lucky enough to get accepted to Texas A&M and really have never looked back. Nice. Um, well, you know, I tell people nowadays, uh, Colonel, that, you know, I own a business where I have to hire and fire people and there are certain things I look for on a resume. And if somebody was an Eagle Scout, or played sports, any kind of competitive sports, that gives them a huge, huge leg up in the uh, in getting an interview at my my job. So, or at my, at my workplace. So, well, so when we were there, uh, Colonel, you when were you at A and M? Roughly, give, give us kind of the time frame you were there. Yeah, so I was there from uh, ninety four to ninety eight. So we, uh, I was there from ninety one to ninety six. So we kind of cross cross paths a little bit, and I, I actually was the wing commander my senior year in the Corps. I did not take an Air Force contract, but I had a lot of friends that wanted Air Force contracts. Quite a few that ended up getting them. Uh, Colonel Urasek, who you probably know. Uh, Neil Sharon, who you may know as well. He was an A-10 pilot. Mm -hmm. but, but back at the time, uh, they weren't handing out pilot slots in the Air Force. I mean, it was not a foregone conclusion that you would get a pilot slot by any stretch of the imagination. So when you went to A&M, Colonel, did you already know at the time that you wanted to fly jets? I did, Brian. Um, and so I was lucky in the sense that I applied for and received the Air Force ROTC scholarship. Nice. And so you could pretty much go, a whole litany of schools would take it. Um, but, you know, I took mine to Texas A&M. And so the answer to your question is yes. I absolutely went to the Corps of Cadets, knowing I wanted to be in the Air Force and knowing that I wanted to be a fighter pilot. That's, you know, I wanted to follow my dad's footsteps. And that was really, you know, what I had my goals set on. And, and as you alluded to, um, I knew that uh, at the time, the fighter, the pilot slots, not just fighter pilots, but just pilot slots in general, were very few and far between. Right, exactly. Um, 
Now I got lucky though, because in 97 and 98, they started opening up the number of slots again. So for individuals who, you know, were graduating in 94, 95, and even your time frame in 96, there were, they were very few and far between, but they opened up a few more uh, my junior and senior year, which was nice. Uh, you know, I have a little bit higher percentage there yeah. of uh, getting a higher slot. So, yeah. Colonel, there's going to be some young people that are listening and probably some parents too uh, of, of young people that are interested in being pilots and in particular being fighter pilots. So can you give us a little bit of advice on kind of what your path was into the cockpit of an F-16? Like how do you, what, what would be your recommendation to young kids that are either in high school or middle school or maybe in college and and they really want to fly planes uh, for the military. How, what would you be your best advice about how they should go about preparing themselves for that kind of a career? Yeah, Brian, that's a, it's a phenomenal question because there's no necessarily right answer, but there are definitely things that you can do to set yourself apart, right? And that's kind of the key. And you've alluded to it already with regards to that well-rounded person concept. Yeah. You know, if you're a male and you achieve the, the rank of Eagle Scout, or if you're a female and you're in Girl Scouting, et cetera, you know, those are ways that you have demonstrated that number one, you can set a goal and then achieve that goal. Um, or if you're a member of a sports team or the debate club or whatever, because you don't have to necessarily be an athlete. I mean, you can do, you can be a mathlete and still be a phenomenal sure. water pilot, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so there's really, no prescription other than my recommendation. What I've always told people is you want to be the most well-rounded individual that you can be because it's not all about academics and it's not all about the social dynamic or just straight pilot skills. It really is, you know, merging all of those skill sets together in order to be, uh, make yourself more competitive. You know, there are certain things that you have to have completed, for instance, you have to graduate from college. You have to have a college degree. Whether you go through a commissioning source like the Reserve Officer Training Corps at AM, or if you go to one of the service academies, whether it be the Air Force Academy or Naval Academy or West Point, you know, or if you just go to, let's say, Florida State, and then you decide to graduate and then subsequently go to officer candidate school, those are basically the three ways with which you can get a commission. And then from there, it really goes down to what your ranking is, Brian, on as they're kind of racking and stacking. And, you know, if you're number one, guess what? You get the number one choice. It's just kind of the way it goes. And that's a lot of that way in life too. Um, and so those are really the first steps uh, to getting your foot in the door. You have to be a commissioned officer. And then the pilot training slots are really handed out based on where you rack and stack amongst your peers. And then if you get a pilot training slot, then it's almost like starting over again as a freshman in the Corps, man. It is, I mean, it literally. <laughs> like the know, Marines going to the basic school, right? They got to basically. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's comical, man, because you're like, dude, I thought I was done with all the shenanigans. And here you are again. And, you know, you're working 12 hour days every day. You would leave right before what we have, a, we call crew rest or pilot rest because you can't do any flight duties. Um, you have to have at least 12 hours between when you've left and when you can come back and you're on formal release. And so you have to get permission to leave. And it's just like being a freshman in the core in the sense that if one person screws up, everybody gets in trouble, you know, and I'm it, so, you know, in a lot of ways, being a freshman in the core, just being a core cadets in general really sets you up um, for success, I would say, in kind of the military and in that pilot training um, a strict regimen. Uh, Cause you know, you're fairly used to following some type of rule set, et cetera. But you know, that's, that's really the bottom line, Brian, is that, you know, making yourself competitive, standing out amongst your peers is key. The whole, you know, rounded, well-rounded person concept, and then graduating from college. And then yeah. from there, figuring out whatever commission and source you have to now become an officer in the United States Air Force in this case, or if you want to be a Marine Corps aviator or a Naval aviator, or whatever, all those requirements are the same. You have to have a college degree. And then from there, you know, some of it's luck, some of it's timing, and some of it's just straight skill. I'm glad you brought that up, by the way, because I was going to mention that for people that may not uh, have quite as much familiarity with the military as you and I do. There are, there are aviators in all the branches of the military. And so you don't necessarily have to get in the US, United States Air Force in order to be an aviator. You could be an Army helicopter pilot. You'd be a Navy Marine jet pod there, there's there's uh, different ways to do it and then there's also colonel 
you don't have to go to the Air Force Academy or a military academy. You can get a pilot slot uh, through through other mechanisms. Although, would, do you think it's fair to say that if you have gone through uh, a program like the Air Force Academy or the Corps Cadets or West Point or one of those service academies that you might uh, be a little bit better prepared than somebody who hasn't experienced that type of lifestyle? I don't know about better prepared because again, Brian, when, man, day one of pilot training is like day one of boot camp, and it's you're broken down and everybody's the same. Um, I will say that uh, you have they hand out more pilot slots. I can only speak intelligently to the Air Force construct, but if you go to the Air Force Academy right now, you are guaranteed a pilot slot if you want it graduating from the Air Force Academy. Really? Wow. If Did you go know. to a major commissioning source like um, the Citadel or VMI or Texas A&M or these large ROTC programs, you are also guaranteed a pilot slot if you want it. And then, you know, the other commissioning sources like Officer Candidate School, et cetera, they have some, you know, a certain number of pilot slots they can give out. But if you, if you want the highest chance of uh, procuring a pilot slot, it is absolutely at the United States Air Force Academy. Hands nice, down. nice, nice. Well, and it's, and, and frankly, I think it's fair to say that getting into the United States Air Force Academy is also very, very difficult to do. As I recall, you still, do you still have to get a recommendation from a senator, from your state senator? You do a, a senator, yes, or a representative, you know, one or the other, each of them get so many um, appointments is what it's called that, you know, they can hand out and that's exactly right. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, you, you will not get into the service Academy without an appointment um, nice. from a sitting representative or a Senator. Colonel, you said something earlier, which I, I want to emphasize a little bit. You talked about being well-rounded and I read a book a couple years ago and, and the book had this idea of what they called the talent stack. And the idea was, you may not be the smartest mathematician. You may not be the best football player. You may not be the best uh, at, at whatever it is, but if you're well-rounded and you can do a number of different things well, then that in combination makes you a much more effective pilot, lawyer, businessman than having a real narrow expertise in one real narrow field. So when, you, when you're talking about being well-rounded, because I really do want uh, the young people listening to this show to understand and appreciate as specifically as possible, the kinds of things that they need to do to be successful if they want to be pilots. What are the kind of uh, aspects of a people's personality? What are you looking for as a, as a Colonel in the United States Air Force? Uh, what kind of skills and talents do you look for uh, specifically when you say somebody is well-rounded? Yeah. So to, to use the saying, nobody wants a one trick pony. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think that a lot of what defines a person is how they react to a stressful situation or a conflict in your life. It's, it's not the problem that defines the person. It's how the person handles or reacts to the problem, which is really what sets individuals apart from each other. Right. Um, you know, I would honestly say that you know, almost anybody can fly a fighter aircraft. Um, it is not that difficult to fly. It's much more difficult to put that aircraft into a certain set of parameters with which to employ weapons, which at the end of the day is what a fighter aircraft is for. Um, but yeah, you know, it just because you get a 1600 near SAT doesn't mean that you're going to be some phenomenal, you know, fighter pilot, nor does it mean that you're going to be a phenomenal lawyer, or phenomenal businessman, et cetera. Now it does say that you have an extremely, you know, high intellect and you have the ability to take tests really well, which is great. But, and so when you look at the well-rounded person, you know, you want somebody who, a, how do they handle adversity? How do they react to a highly stressful situation? How do they work as a team? Because I can tell you right now, you know, there is no successful business leader, um, civic leader, military officer, et cetera, that isn't surrounded by a phenomenal team. Yeah. And so, you know, if 
if you highlight yourself that, hey, you're good by yourself, but the minute that you're put inside of this team dynamic, you fall on your face, then that's not the person that you want because you're only as strong as your weakest link. You can't fly those jets by yourself. You got to have a team, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we, in our core fighting force, if you will, in the F-16 community is a four ship. So four F-16s employing as a teamwork. And every once in a while, you'll go down to a two ship. So two F-16s, but you are never by yourself ever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's the wingman concept that we've all kind of heard before, but you know, it, you take it to a different level when you're employing in combat and you're relying upon that person who's flying a couple of miles away from you to, to keep you safe and vice versa. And so, yeah, you, you can't take somebody who's selfish and not team focused not goal uh, driven, goal oriented, uh, and who only wants to make sure that the team wins. Because if you win by yourself and the team doesn't win, then that, you know, mission lost. It's a mission. That's right. That's right. You know, one thing I've found in the business world is you tend to be a little more successful as a team when you, when you do not care that much who gets the credit. And (laughs) And that, yes. that's kind of a hard, you know, sometimes people want to get a little credit. They do a good job. They want to take a little bit of credit for it and that's okay. But, but if that's what you're looking for, then maybe you're not the best teammate. So w- one other thing I want to ask you about this, Colonel, before we get into your experience uh, flying planes is you mentioned something earlier about racking and stacking them. And, and when you get there, you know, the number one person gets the number one choice and on down the list. So, so what kind of things are they looking for? at pilot school in, in order to, to rank your abilities? Is it, is it, is it just the, uh, the schoolwork and the classwork and stuff like that? Is there a physical component to it? So what, what are the different things they're looking for when they're evaluating uh, potential pilots? Yeah, so Brian, in Air Force pilot training, uh, there is no physical component per se. You don't have to go, I mean, you have to take an annual physical fitness test, but that really has no bearing on how you rack and stack when you graduate from the actual pilot training course. Um, it is essentially, the vast majority of it is your flying aptitude. And so you take tests in the air, they're called check rides. Uh, you know, you're graded on every single event that you do, whether it's a quiz in the classroom, a test in the classroom, um, you know, every single ride that you have in pilot training is a great sheet. It's a graded event, every single one. And then at the end of a block of instruction, then you have um, almost like, you know, end of semester exam, if you will. And so you have to pass that. And then, and that happens at the end of every block. And so it is, you know, it it wears on you. The constant competition is. Oh, I'll bet. it, It is grueling. And it's, Plus it's long hours and it's high stress. And, and you're going like, against the best of the best. I mean, you're going absolutely. against people that there's a reason they're there. It's because they're highly, highly competent people. Oh, yeah, everybody is super type A. I yeah. mean, if you're not type A, you instantly <laughs> weed yourself out. It just is the way it is. And so, and so that really is the answer to your question, Brian. And then about 25 to 30% of it is a, a subjective uh, grading by the instructors in the squadron that you're going through pilot training. And so if you call 70% is made up of the academics and the flying, and then the other 30% is them essentially evaluating you as an individual, where they think you would fit most beneficial to the Air Force. Because again, at the end of the day, it's the Air Force. It's not you. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. They look at it like, hey, you know, this individual would be a good fighter pilot. This individual would be a good tanker pilot, helicopter, stay as a first assignment instructor pilot in pilot training, which is what I did before I went and flew F-16s. Um, and so they place you or they attempt to place you as close as they can to what matches your personality as well. Um, now, is it a perfect system? Absolutely not. I mean, nothing ever is, right? But it works pretty well. Pretty darn um, good, yeah, based yeah. on the results. Yeah, pretty darn Absolutely. good. Well, so so, and when you, you brought up something that I want to just flag here for a second, because you've been an instructor too, right? So you've, you've been basically on both ends of the deal. So you've not only been evaluated, but you've done the evaluating. And so what kind of, when, when you say, I think this person will be a good, fighter pilot or a good tanker pilot or a good helicopter pilot, like what characteristics do you look for, Colonel, 
Uh, what do you think it is that makes somebody a good fighter pilot? Some of it is, man, Brian, that, that is a tough question to put some type of you know, objectivity and solid points towards, but it really is, it is a equal balance of team player, charisma, driven. I mean, you have to be driven. You have to be a hard worker and you have to be able, it, the attention to it, the devil's in the details, right? And it doesn't matter what business you're in, but in the, in the flying business and in the fast jet business, man, details kill, right? And at the yeah. end of the day, you have to be able to trust that individual who's on your left or right wing with your life. Every single time you walk out the door, you're trusting them with your life. And, you, and so that is hard to, to package up. Um, but you know it when you see it. Similar to, I'm sure, you know, when you're litigating or you meet another lawyer and that you have an experience with, you can tell there, there are some that are good and there are some that are really good, yeah, right? And you just sure. know it when you see it. Um, now, does that work every single time? It doesn't, you know, and, and you make, we all make mistakes. We all make bad judgments or on character, et cetera. But, um, you know, what I found is if you, you can take somebody who um, is highly detail oriented, a team player, um, extremely aggressive, but also charismatic and cares about the people around them and making the, the team move forward is really what I have found um, kind of the best, I guess, mental recipe to be a fighter pilot. You know, Colonel, I was talking to uh, Bucky Richardson uh, last week about uh, on the podcast about some leadership issues. And one of the things that he said, and we had a conversation about this, was about uh, judgment and trusting your instinct. So while it sounds like some of the evaluation you do may be a little, quote, subjective, what you're really talking about, I think, is taking very experienced military fighter pilots and they, they have a, a, a sense, a sense of a developed sense of judgment. And, you know, we were talking, Bucky and I were talking, and it wasn't until I was maybe in my early 40s that I started really paying attention to my gut, my instincts. And I noticed when I kind of look back on my life, the times where I ignored my instincts or my gut, I normally made a bad decision. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of research on this. I mean, the, there's a, for example, there's a a guy named Gavin DeBecker, who's an international security expert. He does Jeff Bezos and all these other people. And he wrote this book and I, I read it. And one of the things he talks about is a book about personal safety, keeping yourself safe. One of the things he talks about is trust your instincts. Like if you're someplace and something doesn't feel right, uh, you need to listen to your instincts. And, and so it really gave me a new appreciation for you know, like you said at the, at the very beginning of this piece of the conversation, it's hard to put into words, but when you've been doing stuff long enough, you develop this sense of judgment, this instinct on who will and will not be a good fighter pilot or like you said, a good lawyer or a good whatever. So speak to that a little bit, if you don't mind, like the, the value of developing judgment and the value of trusting your instincts. So Brian, it's really fascinating you bring this point up. So I, as much as I love flying jets, the Air Force takes you out of your comfort zone, if you will, out of a fighter squadron, and then they put you in what professional military education, which is kind of, it's going to get a master's essentially. Um, and then you have to do a staff job at some point. And prior to being here, back here at Nellis, uh, my staff job is I was the de de deputy executive officer to the commander of the United States Central Command, which is one of six geographic combatant commands that we have around the world. And so he was a four-star general, and I, I mean, I learned more about myself and about being an officer in the United States military in the 18 months that I served under him than I had in my 18 and a half years of service leading up to that point. It was wow. a phenomenal life experience, but he, one of his four tenants was trust your instincts. So when he would talk to his other commanders and he's as high as you can get, right? Yeah. Um, and when he would talk to his other commanders, he would say exactly that is trust your instincts because your instincts are what got you here and yeah. they haven't failed you so far. Now, you know, if, if you blindly trust anything, then that's a mistake in and of itself. But it, I am a firm believer that trusting your instincts, um, you know, whether that be in a dangerous situation or whether that be judging somebody's um, if they're right for the next position or whatever the case may be, your instincts 99% of the time are correct. 
No doubt about it. You know, in the context I was talking to it with Bucky, he was choosing between going to LSU or A&M to play football. And he was from Louisiana. They don't let kids get out of Louisiana. That's a very, very difficult decision for a guy like him. And he said it basically, you know, I did all the research, did all the homework, talked to all the people. And it, but at the end of the day, it just felt like the right place. My instincts told me it was the right place. And he was like, man, it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. And, you know, the thing, Colonel, that I used to get hung up about was, you know, because I think, you know, I have an engineering degree. I, I really like math and stuff like that. So I'm kind of, I have a tendency to be kind of analytical. And I think sometimes I have a tendency to be over analytical. I overanalyze stuff. And so it's not like, you and I are talking about don't do your homework, don't do your preparation. We're not saying that at all. We're saying do all that stuff. But on top of that, you got to be able to trust your gut, your instincts, right? Because at the end of the day, you can research things up, down, left, and right, but you got to make a decision. And sometimes the decision's not going to be black and white. And so what are you going to use? You're going to use your, your judgment and your instincts. Well, that's really cool. Well, let me ask you, Colonel, because I noticed on your resume that you, you worked for uh, combat command. What's the proper military term for? You were talking about the general just now. What's the proper term for Yeah, the, so the, General Joseph Botel, uh, he is now retired, but prior to his retirement, he was the commander of United States Central Command. And that is the way that the military parses up the world is essentially in geographic combatant commands. And so United States Central Command essentially encompasses uh, the Middle East, Southwest Asia, um, you know, some of the not so lovely places on the planet. And yeah. so, yeah, so I was working directly for him, but it, it, the official term is United States Central Command. Central Command. Okay. And the person, the general you were working for was in charge of the entire thing. He was the top dog. And you said earlier that you learned more in 18 months than you learned in your previous 18 years. You talked about one of his rules about trusting your instincts, trusting your gut. But tell us a little bit more, if you don't mind, about what else you learned serving in that position. Because this is a, this is a leadership podcast, and I, it's really interesting you'd say that. I'd love to hear about a few more lessons you learned. Yeah, it, it, Brian, it was, it was fascinating because what is interesting about that part of the world, not only has the United States military obviously been actively engaged in you know, war over there since even before 9-11, right? Everybody kind of equates to 9-11, but the, United, the Air Force in particular never left uh, after the first Iraq war in 91. And we were flying uh, Operation Northern Watch and Southern Watch before um, re-engaging in combat operations in Afghanistan and then subsequently Iraq. But, you know, so that area of the world, without overstating the obvious, is an extremely volatile place. And it is all about relationships. And what is fascinating about the commander of the United States Central Command, especially the one that I worked for, General Battelle, was that oftentimes, to use uh, an A&M phrase, he was the soldier, the statesman, and the knightly gentleman all at the same time. Because in certain places, he was not only the senior military officer, he was the senior American statesman. You know, and then he also had to play both sides of the coin. So he had to be a he had to be a politician. He had to be, you know, essentially a State Department representative. And they obviously had to carry the hammer, if you will, from the military side. And so um, really unique. And, and he would say he would give the senior leader engagement to his commanders. And, you know, one of his principles was developing relationships. And you know, it sounds super easy. Like, oh, yeah, no kidding. You know, but part of the developing the relationships is is listening first. I, I think, and especially in my career field, we are very apt to just not listen and just respond, right? Sure. But you know, part of listening is understanding the problem or understanding what's being presented to you. So, you know, listening first, understanding, and then responding last, because guess what? Sometimes establishing a relationship or a dialogue, you don't even have to respond, right? You know, right. sometimes silence is good. Um, you know, the other piece of that puzzle is not all relationships are positive. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, well, I have a good relationship, but that doesn't mean the relationship's good. You may be jovial with somebody or you may be on, you know, friendly terms, but that doesn't mean you have a good operational kind of working relationship. And I'm taking this more from kind of a military perspective than anything, but I think it applies, you know, broad brush across basically anything that you would do in your life. Um, communicating effectively, man, you know, 
the, the military, as you're well aware, is you know, full of this, you know, hierarchy and chain of command, et cetera. But yeah. things can get lost in the, we call it the frozen middle, man, and things can just die. Yeah. And so General Patel was very much of uh, communicate early and often and keep it as flat as you can. So at the, at, as the four-star general, he wanted to talk to his commanders on the ground. It didn't matter if that was a captain, a lieutenant, because what he found in his 40-year career was that, you know, the, the folks in that frozen middle, they may have a good idea, but I can tell you who exactly knows, and it's that first lieutenant or that company grade officer who's down on the ground in the trenches, you know, for lack of a better term. What a brilliant, gonna... what a brilliant man. What a brilliant man. I mean, that's just, that, that's just a brilliant way of leading because, you know, one of the things that, I, that, I, that I've seen, there's been patterns in this podcast, Colonel, is the best leaders that I've talked to don't think they know everything. As a matter of fact, they know they don't know everything, yes. right? And so, but, but what they do know, what they do know, Colonel, is they know who to ask. They know where to get the information. They don't assume they know everything. I mean, what, what, what great leadership advice. Yeah. And if you think, I mean, again, it goes back to that team concept, right? It takes every single person on the team. And I, I can personally tell you that if you believe that you know the answers to every question, you will fail. You yeah. will fail as a leader, no matter military, lawyer, businessman, civic leader, it doesn't matter because yeah, you, nobody has the bandwidth to understand all of the finite data that's going on. And the larger the organization, the more finite the data in the larger pool of information you need to understand. And you can't, you physically can't um, keep your arms around it. It's the bottom line. You know, the other piece of that communication too, Brian, is communicating the good and the bad. We all want to tell the good story, right? But, you know, in, in yeah. life, there's also bad data that needs to get communicated. And, you know, whether you are the leader, the lowest or the highest in that organization, you know, bad news doesn't get better with time. And, uh, great you know, advice. Great if, advice. If you're, if your boss is surprised, then you screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> you no doubt. Up no doubt. Surprised. I think we've all experienced that. Um, and one way or another, you know, and then the other piece of the puzzle is I think you have to know yourself and know how you communicate, but more importantly, know how either a, the leaders abo above you or the leaders below you or your peers, how they take communication, right? Because the way that I receive info and the way that you receive info could be completely different. And as a leader, I need to understand that. Um, whether you're my, my boss or you know, my subordinate, I have to know how to communicate to you. And in that way, um, the message and the intent and the mission is clear. Colonel, you, you literally said so many things right there. I'm getting chills down my spine. My head feels like it's about to explode. I mean, you have leadership literally coming out of your pores, but let me try to break down a couple of those things, if you don't mind, because I think they're so important. W one of the things you said about the general you worked for, soldier, statesman, knightly gentleman, for people that didn't go to A&M or not familiar with that saying, the, the idea is that's kind of the perfect uh, military person. He or she is a soldier, a statesman, and a knightly gentleman or gentlewoman. And it kind of sounds like what we were talking about earlier, being well-rounded, being able to do a lot of different things well. Uh, and then, and then you talked about listening and, you know, I tell my clients, for instance, before they go in and give sworn testimony, I say, you need to listen to the question, but don't listen to the question the way I listen to my wife sometimes where I'm shaking my head, but I'm not really paying attention. Right. Yeah. You know, real, truly listening to people is a skill. And, and then, and it takes work to be a good listener because you have to be willing to shut up for a little bit and to truly pay careful attention to what the other person is saying rather than, and I've, I know you've experienced this before, Colonel, I know we all have, sometimes you'll be hearing something and instead of listening, you're already formulating your own response in your head, right? That's not yep. real, that's pretend listening, right? And then the final thing you said, which I think is, which is just, I mean, one of the most important points I think any leader uh, can do is, is being out there, knowing who to go to, to get the right information and not presuming that you know everything about everything. So what, what a testament, what, what a great description of, of, of leadership skills. 
and we could talk about that for for hours, Colonel. But but I want to switch topics now just a little bit, if you don't mind. And I want to talk about what it's like to be sitting in the cockpit of an F sixteen. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I I, I just. For, for the vast majority of people in the world, we will never experience that. Like, what was it like the first time you were in that plane by yourself and you hammered that throttle forward? What, what's that feel like? So I will say this, and hopefully there's no A-10 drivers that get their feelings hurt. but Because <laughs> that's a super slow plane. Right? Yeah. So when I went to pilot training, man, I went, my, like I was saying, my old man was an OB-10, a FAC-A, you know, close air support pilot. And I was like, I want to fly the A-10, right? That's what I want to do. And then in pilot training. The warthog, I think they used right. to call it, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. The second stage of pilot training is you go to T-38. So if you're going to go fly fighters. And the first time I let the afterburner on a fighter jet it was a small fighter right not f-16 just a t-38 i'm getting butterflies in my stomach yeah. right now <laughs> keep the a-10 man i want something that goes fast <laughs> so yeah so and i'll tell you you know in the the t-38 is a phenomenal training platform but then you go to the f-16 and it it's hard to explain brian i mean it is literally and, and the f-16 is not the premier fighter anymore you know now it's the f-35 but the amount of power it, it really is, it's jolting. It's amazing. I mean, sitting inside of it's one thing, but it, everything happens so fast. You accelerate so fast that yeah. you get used to it, but it never ceases to amaze me when I'm on the ground and like watching an afterburner engine run when the maintenance troops are out there doing their work on it. And you, it like shakes the breath out of your chest. It's an, it's an insane, um, it's almost euphoric. It's amazing. It, I, I love it. I, I try to fly twice a week, um, you know, t as much as I can. Uh, it, it's, it is honestly, it is, I don't know. I'm living my boyhood dream is the bottom line. Man. I, I could not have, I, I'm lucky. I'm extremely lucky. So, so like, uh, let me ask you a couple of technical questions. And by the way, Colonel, anything, I'm going to try not to ask you anything that's obviously not something you can talk about, but if I do just, we can just move on. But but like when you when you just hammer that throttle forward, how many G's are you experiencing it when you're like taking that plane off? Like how many G's are you hit with right off the bat? You don't get a lot of G. I mean, it's accelerating. It's like accelerating on a roller coaster, right? Okay. So think of the one of those roller coasters that has that straight shot. That's what it feels like. So it's it's this lateral G, and it's not you know other than pinning you back in the seat like in a fast race car or whatever. That's about what it is. It's the, the performance of the aircraft is really not until you're in the air. And that's when, you know, and, and, and of course, the faster you get to a point, then the more uh, performance the aircraft has. And that's, and so the F-16 is a 9G capable aircraft. And so, you know, if you think of your brain, you know, how much your Man. nugget weighs, what, yeah. 25 pounds. So now you multiply that times nine, you know, if you're not in the right body position or whatever, next thing you know you're looking down at your toes type deal um but it, yeah it's it it's an amazing feeling i mean it it, it is very taxing on the body initially but it's like yeah. anything your body gets used to it um you know and you, so short, what short, what, sorry. what is yeah no that's okay so colonel so and we so when you're talking about taking off that's more of a lateral force but when we're, we're talking about geez that's the force of gravity interacting with the pilot's mm -hmm. body so nine g's is that Essentially, does that mean kind of mathematically nine times normal gravity or is it exponential? Yeah. Okay, so so basically your entire body is being pressed on or, or there's forces interacting on your body in that plane that can knock you out, essentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's called a G-induced loss of consciousness. And so not to say a mouthful, we just call it a G-lock. Um, but that's exactly what it is. And so when you are under, so right now we are sitting at one G, you and I, the world is at one G. Yeah. And then um, based on the performance capabilities of an aircraft, the acceleration is what causes that G onset. And so the faster I am, the more, um, the better performing the aircraft is. And then the higher G's that you can hit or pull and then the higher G rate, which with you, you can sustain. And so you wear this anti-exposure suit, which lack for lack of a better description is essentially looks like a pair of chaps yeah. that plugs into the aircraft that fills up with air. And all that does is it squeezes your abdomen and your legs and you have an anti G strain maneuver. 
And the deal, what you're trying to do is keep as much blood up in your brain as you can. Gotcha. Um, and gotcha. so you can sustain G's for a while, but at some point, you know, you have to relax the G um, in order to maintain consciousness. Sure. Colonel, so give us a couple examples, if you can. You, you said the the real performance of the aircraft happens in the air. Uh, tell us, give us a couple examples that you can think of, of like some super cool stuff that that aircraft can do that most aircraft cannot do. Well, so I, you know, most listeners aren't ever going to be able to see, you know, what a fighter jet does in application, right? Unless you're on the receiving end of the bad end of the bomb. <laughs> and you're not going to um, see it for very long. <laughs> but, but what you can relate to is, you know, whether you're watching the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels, right? There you go. And so that is probably the best descriptor that you can use. And so that's really, you know, what those teams are doing in is demonstrating the power of these fighter aircraft, right? So for the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, it's the F-16. For the Blue Angels, it's the F-18. And then the different fighter, fighter platforms have these single ship demonstrations that'll go out. But that's really, and so, you know, what I like to say, the Thunderbirds do a loop on takeoff. And so the, the diamond, which is in the picture in your background there, Brian, you know, they take off and as soon as they lift off, they bring the gear up and then they immediately start a pull because the jet is accelerating so fast that if the, the gear don't come up in time, you can actually overspeed the gear. And then you're not even in full afterburner. So you're not even using full power as you continue to do this, this loop on takeoff. And it's just, it's really, what that is demonstrating is that your thrust to weight ratio is better than one to one. So your power exceeds the weight with which the aircraft weighs by more than a factor of one, if that makes sense. For wow, yeah, no, yeah, no, that 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 does make sense. Uh, well, and that and that's kind of the perfect uh, segue into your experience with the Thunderbirds because you've been a Thunderbirds pilot for a while now. And I want I want you to talk a little bit about how you became a Thunderbirds pilot. But I have a question that I really want to ask you because it's been on my mind for a while now. I understand that sometimes. Uh, the Thunderbirds are flying at, at in excess of 550 knots, cl as close as 18 inches uh, apart. And so how is that, I mean, how is that even possible? How do you fly those jets going at that kind of speed in the air that close with that much precision? Trust and teamwork, my friend. Yeah. I mean, oh, my gosh. Kidding. <laughs> so I, got, I have to correct you a little bit there, Brian. So first off, when you are selected for a Thunderbird, you typically only will do two show seasons. That equates to about three years, give or take, because it takes about six to seven months of training. And then you do two show seasons, which is over the course of two years. And then you have to train your replacement. And then when you're done, you're done. So, you know, I finished my tour on the Thunderbirds after the 2011 show season. So I did the 2010, the 2011 show season. And then I went back to the combat air forces, if you will. So I just so happens that I'm back at Nellis as the operations group commander here. But um, to get back to your original question, you know, the, the Thunderbirds have 12 officers and they, in a typical year, will, will replace about half of the officers, um, which is in that way, you always have some continuity. Um, of the 12, six actually fly in the demonstration. So you have Thunderbirds one through four, which makes up the diamond, and then Thunderbirds five and six are the solos. And then you have uh, various uh, support officers. There's a narrator, you have the operations officer who's also your safety observer, and then you have a flight doc and public affairs and an executive officer, et cetera. So, um, but you know, the call goes out and you apply and it's just like any other business you know, interview process, you go out, you actually travel with the team because it's quite an undertaking. You know, you're on the road, um, you know, roughly 260 ish days a year when you're on the Thunderbirds, essentially from mid March to mid November is when you're doing the various show seasons. Uh, and so you, they are interviewing you as much as you are interviewing them for lack of a better term to make sure that that's something that you want to do because it is, and, and it's, it's quite taxing. Um, tons, you know, of travel, I, right? tons of travel, tons of travel. Tons of travel. I mean, you're on the road, you know, minimum, you know, and in a normal week, you would leave on Thursday, come back Monday, you'd practice on Tuesday, off Wednesday, and then you're back on the road. Can I ask um, but a, then there was a also, silly question? Yeah. When you, when you travel, do you actually fly your jet from place to place? 
Absolutely. That, Absolutely. See, that seems kind of cool to me, actually. <laughs> no, man, it's, it's, <laughs> You're still away from your family a lot, but actually getting there in an F-16, that, that's about as cool as I can imagine. No, I mean, it was, yeah, it was great. I, it was, honestly, Brian, it was one of the most unique experiences that I've had as a fighter pilot. Um, because it's really the own, like I was saying earlier, you know, when you take off and then you go do your mission and you come back, but people don't ever see what you do. And the whole purpose behind the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels is to really, you know, represent the pride, the precision, the professionalism of the United States Armed Forces. It's not just the Air Force. It's not just the Navy Marines. It's, it's really representing to the American public what it is that their armed forces is doing. And we're doing that through showcasing basically combat air power using frontline combat fighter aircraft. So um, when you're you know, when flying 18 inches apart or however close, I mean, it's just ridiculously close. I, I guess I'm surprised at your answer a little bit because I thought maybe there would be some, some buttons you could push or something that would help you maintain that distance. But you're saying that's just, that's just practice. This is practice. That's right. So, Thunderbird one is the commander leader and uh, you're essentially in constant communications on the radio. And so the, the Thunderbird leader is, you know, he is, he or she is communicating over the radio. If they're moving in the power, if they're adjusting the pull, uh, et cetera. And so it's essentially voice inflection as to how much power they're pulling back or adding in or how much pull they're putting on the aircraft. Uh, and then that 18 inches, uh, is the closest that you'll get some formations a little bit further out, but that is you really you're months into the show season before you get into that close. You know, yeah. it, it does, it takes repetition doing the same thing over and over and over. And it's kind of like your golf game, man. Each day is different. You know, the environmental conditions are different and some days you're better than others. And sometimes you're just off your game and it's, yeah, it, it, it was really a unique opportunity and you, know, you get to travel to places that you would never probably go in the continental United States and you're able to meet just amazing people who love this country and they support the military and now you're able to to showcase to them what their tax dollars hopefully are actually paying for yeah. and at the same time you know some of it is selfish too Brian because you know the United States military is an all-volunteer force right and so we rely on a steady pool of recruitment so you always need new officers and new enlisted, et cetera, and no better way than to take that and do it kind of in an air show circuit for, uh, is the platform that we're using to A, you know, recruit some uh, new airmen, if you're in the Air Force, retain the ones that you have, and then lastly representing, as I've already alluded to, what the United States military is doing on a daily basis. And so it was really a phenomenal opportunity to meet some amazing people. I think my favorite part was every Friday you would do uh, a practice air show, but it would always be for some special needs group or like a make a wish or whatever. So some child who may be terminally ill, who's been stuck in a hospital, they're able to come out to the air show and they watch that and to put a smile on a child's face that potentially won't be there the next week or the next month to me was probably the most moving piece of, of my entire tenure on the Thunderbirds. It was just, it was a phenomenal experience. That, that I'm getting chills again. That that's so Cool. Colonel, uh, I want to talk a little bit. Do you have a couple more? Do you have a few more minutes for me? I've got at least 30 more minutes. Okay, cool. So I want to talk a little bit about your experience in, in combat. But before we do that, I want to know where you got the nickname Nuke. <laughs> it's on, matter of <laughs> fact, you got, good, it on yeah. your, your, you got it on your uniform right I now. I have it. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> Yeah, so this will not instill a lot of faith and confidence, uh, your faith and confidence in me as a combat aviator. But yeah, so when I showed up to my first uh, operational F-16 assignment, um, we do what's called strafing. It's essentially sh shooting the gun at the ground. And uh, I was not good, man. I, was not, I could not hit the broad side of a barn. And so I don't know, after like the third or fourth time and we get back to the debrief and you, everything's taped, right? And so you can see it, man, I'm not hitting anything. And you get, there's a scoring system out there. It's like this acoustic scoring system. So there's no line, there's no getting around it. There's no, no fudging the numbers, right? And finally, one of my instructors just looks at me and he's like, dude, he goes, we're gonna call you nuke because you need a nuclear weapon to destroy the target. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, yeah. So typically your call sign is not something that, um, you know, you're, you're proud of per se. You, you earn it. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. It's always up for renewal too, man. It is always up for renewal. So Absolutely. We, I had a couple of nicknames. When I was playing basketball at A&M, I had a couple of nicknames. And let's just say that my buddies gave me nicknames that – we're not supposed to be that complimentary at first. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. The more you dislike it, then the, the better it the is. Right? It becomes. That's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, that kind of reminds me, I, I'm a huge fan of British naval history. I've read a lot of, uh, a, a lot of books, both fiction and nonfiction about it, but the, probably the most famous British admiral ever, the, the man who won the battle of Trafalgar, where if, if the British would have lost, the French would have, I mean, had an open sea lane to come uh, onto the land was uh, Horatio Nelson. And this is a, this is a British, he, 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 you know, he started as a midshipman, but it eventually became an admiral. And he got seasick when he first started going on ships, like violently seasick. And he ended up being, I mean, there's a statue to him in Trafalgar Square, rightfully so. And sure. uh, he actually died at the Battle of Trafalgar. But, but it kind of reminds me of, the, of that story, you know, but you just got to be persistent. You know, you got to stick with it and stuff like that. And eventually, eventually you'll learn. It's a good story, actually, because it shows that even somebody with your skill, ability, uh, precision, uh, you weren't perfect when you first started. Yeah, flying far from it, my friend. Yeah, yeah, far, far from it. And you, you worked at it to get better. Well, let's talk a little bit, Colonel, if you don't mind about, and what, what I want to know about combat is, is a couple of things. One of the things I want to know is how combat is different qualitatively between all the training you're doing. So you do tons of training, tons of practice, you, you, you prepare, but once you're in combat, what's, what, how is it different? And that's one of the things I want to know. And the other thing I want to know, and I've asked a number of, uh, of the other military combat veterans on the show is, is when you're first going to combat, what's going through your mind? What are you thinking? Yeah. So Brian, I'll tell you right now, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and you've, I mean, you've had some, you know, true American heroes on there. And when it's, you know, Toby Flynn and Blake Sawyer, et cetera. And I will honestly say that the experience that uh, you have on the ground in combat is drastically different than the experience that you have in the air in combat. My, my and, father says the exact same thing. He said there was a different experience in Vietnam for me than it was for Mike Baggett, who was a grunt on the ground. It was a different experience. That's right. That says the yeah, same it's, thing. It's, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's like mixing apples and oranges. And I mean, my hat's off to, to the soldiers who, who have done it, who are doing it right now as we're doing this podcast and will continue to sign up to do it. To me, it's an amazing uh, act of selflessness yeah. to you know, support and defend the constitution of the United States in ground combat. Um, so to talk about a couple things, Brian, so training in a perfect world, you want your training to be as close to realistic combat as it can possibly be. And that's one of the things that we do really good in the United States Air Force, especially from a fighter side of the house. And we do the world's premier combat training exercise here at Nellis Air Force Base, it's called Exercise Red Flag. And it is supposed to emulate the first 10 combat stories that you have. So in theory, those, your first couple of flights in this red flag exercise should be more difficult than your first uh, 10 combat sorties. But realize that this exercise red flag is more for what we would call a major combat operation, kind of near peer force on force. What was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan is a completely different fight, right? You know, whether you were talking about Fallujah and the urban house to house fighting, uh, you know, all over in Iraq, down in Basra, all the way in the south. And so just a completely different training set than what we had trained for leading up to kind of the, the 2000, the late 2001, early 2002 operations into Afghanistan, you know, into this mountainous region where we had been training for this basically. Was that your first combat deployment was Afghanistan? No, mine was actually in Iraq, you know, and, and so, and we had not necessarily been training for this close quarters urban fight where everybody looks the same and trying yeah. to discern who is the enemy and where the friendlies are as they're taking friendly fire. And you've got these young kids yelling on the radio that, Hey, we're getting shot at, or they've already been hit by an IED, et cetera. And so it's a completely different um, 
problem set to focus on. And so our training was really good, but our training was much more for this high end threat than it was for this close air support. And so there was a lot of, you know, just figuring it out on the fly. Right. And, yeah. and, and to be honest, Brian, you know, the enemy always has a vote, number one. And then number two is no matter how good of a plan training or otherwise you have, Dude, it's like stepping in the boxing ring. You may have the best game plan in the world. And as soon as you get hit in the mouth, man. Yeah. All, oh, geez. All I off. love all that saying. Off, man. It's go That's time. That's a great man. saying. I forget who said that. But, yeah, you can train all you want. But once you step in the ring and get punched in the face, yeah, things, yeah. things are off. Yeah, the things change. Yeah, I mean, the enemy always has a vote and no plan survives first contact. And that's kind of the, the, the euphemism that I used to use about getting hit in the mouth. You know, it, it, things change and, and you adapt and you, and you figure it out. And, you know, our, our vehicles that the soldiers were using on the ground, the weapons that we were using in the air were not optimized for these, you know, low collateral damage where you wanted to hit, you didn't want to take out a house. We had some great stuff to take out a house, but you needed to be able to take out or neutralize just a small room or a small corner. And that it, it's extremely tough. And so there was a, you know, a lot of gnashing of the teeth, but I mean, we have really, it, it's amazing what can happen when you are forced to figure out a way to win yeah. right? or a way to, um, and I'm not saying that we're winning or losing or anything. I'm just saying when you are forced to adapt and overcome and you allow folks the opportunity um, to think outside of the normal paradigm and think outside the box, it is phenomenal to watch the United States come together and in a consolidated effort to get better. Yeah. And, and it's really what we did as a military industrial complex is we completely changed how we prepared for combat, how we executed in combat, the tactics, the techniques and procedures, the weaponry, et cetera. You know, it's pretty phenomenal. I think it was Blake that told me, it was either Blake, Toby, or Nick Colt that told me their first uh, deployment was completely different from their second deployment because I think the first one, they, they were just basically rushing towards Baghdad. But then the second deployment, they're literally fighting in catacombs. like not hand-to-hand -hand combat, but pretty close to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Sure. And so they had to adopt uh, to, to that strategy. As a matter of fact, I think, was it General Petraeus that came up with the with the counterinsurgency strategy that ended up being so successful? I don't know wh whether it was him or not, but like you're saying, we basically had to kind of reinvent our approach to this war because the enemy wasn't just standing there doing predictable things. Like they had, they had, taken a different approach with us and so we have to take a different approach with them and that requires what I think is a very very important skill and that's mental flexibility I've been telling my kids and family since the quarantine started you know I, I, I'm getting a little sick of saying this but you, you have to be mentally flexible you have to be able to dodge you know go with the flow whatever whatever cliche you want to use but that kind of sounds like that's a skill that uh the people in the military people in the air force the pilots had to develop because i would think colonel that you know probably the most important thing when you're flying combat sport operations is making sure you don't hit our our people right and they're right down there mixed up with with a lot of the enemy combatants so so that would probably be kind of tricky at times too, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fog and friction of the war of war is real. You know, Clausewitz talked about it. I mean, it's fog and friction and figuring out who is who in the zoo is difficult, especially when everybody, you know, the, the enemy would procure U.S. military uniforms. Yeah. And so it was nothing there. Fewer things are worse than combat than having what's called a, fat, a fratricide. And that's where, you know, you kill your own troops on the ground. Yeah. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest, you know, I, fears or the concerns that you have. It's in the back of your brain. You want to make sure that you know when you hit the button and that weapon is coming off the aircraft that you know exactly what your intended target is. Yeah. You know, and that doesn't matter if that's in training and combat, et cetera. No, it is. It, yeah. It, it, agility, combat, agility is key. Because um, if you are wedded to the plan, you are destined for failure. Yeah, you, you got to be, you got to have a plan, you got to prepare, but you got to be willing to toss the plan in the garbage can if it's not working sometimes and try something different. Well, let me ask you this question, Colonel Gallimore. 
you're currently the commander of the 57th operation group. I think that's, or you're in, uh, in Nevada. So tell us how many, how many people the, are in the 57th operations group? Like how many people are you in charge of total? Yeah, Brian. So yes, I'm the commander of the 57th operations group. I've got 10 squadrons uh, and then three detachments that are spread out between Nellis Fort Polk, Louisiana, Fort Irwin, California, Camp Bullis, just outside of San Antonio, down at Davis Monthan in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and then finally in uh, Oklahoma City. So I've got about 900 personnel. Um, I've got 32 F-16s. I've got uh, a team of cyber aggressors, the only ones in the United States Air Force. Um, so, yeah. What's a cyber uh, aggressor? A cyber aggressor. So think about all of the things that you see in the news about what North Korea or China or Russia is doing to attack um, cyber networks and cyber systems. And so I have a team that uh, emulates that on the blue forces. So well, I've, been, I've been very, very not to interrupt you, Colonel, but as a computer science guy for a very long time, somebody in student technology, I have been extremely concerned about uh, the cyber warfare. For instance, I don't know if you saw, but I think it was two or three weeks ago, there was a, there was a Twitter hack and, mm -hmm. Some very prominent people had their account accounts hacked, and I just was sitting there wondering, man, what if somebody hacked uh, some prominent politician's account and they tweeted something out that wasn't true? But man, that could have real world ramifications. So, so that is certainly something. You know, this 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 cyber war is certainly something. You know, back when I was a computer science, nobody uh, computer science nobody cared about it because it, all it did was you know destroy your hard drive. But nowadays, stuff that's going on online can have real world consequences. And so that, that's really interesting to hear. Do you guys have any or do y'all have any uh, drones or anything like that? Like, where do you think uh, the drones kind of fit in with or, or is that not part of the Air Force? Well, so, yeah. Now, are you talking about like the large scale drones? Like, like the, the Reaper the, drones and stuff like that. The combat yeah, drones. They're absolutely part of the Air Force and they are an integral part in, we do not, I personally do not have any in the 57th operations group, but Creech Air Force Base, which is just up the road from Nellis is really the, the unmanned aerial vehicle uh, mecca, if you will. That's really where they started and, you know, they're, they're based all over now, but yeah, they, they are intricately involved in any type of combat plan and combat operation. And they provide a very unique skill set um, that you know, manned aircraft or piloted aircraft uh, physically sitting in the cockpit can't necessarily do, especially for the lengths of time and, and the sensors and things that they can put on those, those drone aircraft. Is, is, it's an impressive enterprise that the Air Force, you know, out of necessity has developed um, in order to to preserve the fighter fleet, for lack of a better term. So I actually got to sit in a drone simulator a couple weeks ago, and oh my gosh, that was so cool. They were showing me how how detailed you could get with some of the camera technology. I mean, you can literally see if somebody has a mustache or not, and it's just, the technology is amazing. But Colonel, I, I didn't think we were going to talk about this, but if you don't mind, I'm curious to ask you this question. Where do you think the interplay between UAVs or unmanned aircraft and manned aircraft is headed? I mean, are we going to a point eventually where we won't have any manned aircraft or is there always going to be a need for man manned aircraft? Or what, what do you see kind of, what, what is the future of air power for the United States? Well, I mean, you may have seen, Brian, uh, DARPA has been doing some testing on AI and they actually built an AI simulator that fought an F-16 pilot a couple weeks ago now. Really? And, I did not see that. Yeah, I mean, it's all, I mean, the AI simulator won hands down every time. <clears throat> um, so I do believe that at some point, technology will allow where you no longer have to have a pilot physically sitting in the aircraft. Yeah. Um, I think we're still a ways out from that, but I absolutely think it's feasible that, um, maybe towards the end of our lifetime, but definitely in our children's lifetimes that you could potentially see an initial wave of combat aircraft that are all remotely piloted, then followed by, um, you know, piloted aircraft where pilots are physically sitting in the cockpits, then going in. I think that is absolutely. And then, 
you know, the other thing that you alluded to is the interoperability for uh, between the systems is, is absolutely the way forward, right? Because the more connected you can be in the battle space, then the more situational awareness you have with which to continue to prosecute the enemy. I am so interested in AI and stuff like this. As a matter of fact, I drive a Tesla. The reason I drive a Tesla is because I'm really into the, the technology behind it. And I can tell you, uh, I even, I even, I'm such a nerd that I watched the three hour technical presentation on their self driving uh, hardware and software. I mean, they built all their own chips and everything. And, you know, the advantage that Tesla has right now is all their, they got a million plus cars and they're all talking to each other and they're using yes. deep, deep learning is what they call it. But, you know, one of the things that, that I've noticed, cause I, I use autopilot in the Tesla when I can is it's, it's, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a while. It's not there yet. There's too much. I, I don't know when we're going to get there. I think eventually we're going to get there, but it, it's it's not it's not that smart right now. I'll just say I'll put it that way. But but I am really interested in it because you know there are there are now AIs that read uh, radio uh, radiograms better than a radiologist. They they read MRIs better than a radi radiologist. There are, I mean, we all know that there are AIs that human beings will never beat a computer in chess ever for the rest of history, and now they're beating humans in games like Go where they don't even give them the rules ahead of time they're learning the rules and and so this is a really really fascinating topic and the other thing we you know another thing we've got to think about is ai safety and you know if we deploy a bunch of ai drones we got to be dang sure that we're extremely clear about what their mission is so they don't start doing things that we don't anticipate right yeah and i think that's the that's the moral dilemma right now right for lack of a a different way to put it's it is an ethical question. It's not really a technical question. It's yeah, it absolutely question. is. Yeah. You know, and, and so to have a person, a, a human being in the loop uh, is where the technology is right now. But I do believe that we will be able to, through more research and development, produce an AI system that can completely autonomously operate and make decisions. Yeah. Um, as well as be presented with ethical and moral dilemmas and still make a decision as good and sometimes better than a human because the machine won't necessarily have all of um, the bias, right? Yeah. That, that we have as, as humans. It's just, you know, these, these, are, these, are, these are really, really, really important questions. I talked to Will Hurd, Representative Will Hurd, about some of this stuff, 5G technology and AI. He's a computer science guy as well. But, but I love the way you put that. It, these are, I mean, they're technical questions, of course, but really at the end of the day, they're ethical questions or moral questions. So for instance, with a self-driving car, what are you going to tell the car to do when it's driving down the road and a four-year-old girl runs out to pick up her soccer ball but there's four kids on the side of the street so you got a choice to either turn and hit those or go straight i mean and there's no good choices and the point of it is we have to think about these things because the the machine is going to do what we tell it to do and so if we build in some ethical restrictions and some moral restrictions that'll be good but there's going to be instances where we just can't foresee things and so how do you build judgment into a smart machine? Let, let me let me switch topics just real quick. And I normally I wouldn't ask you this, but this has been all over the news. I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on the, some of these videos that they've been releasing. I think there were naval aviators that saw these kind of odd shapes and stuff moving around. I'm always extremely skeptical of these kind of things, but I'm just curious to know what you, what, what you as a pilot think about all this stuff. So this is John Gallum we're talking. I have 3,900 flight hours, which yeah. is a decent amount. I have never seen an object that was not, that I couldn't identify. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are flying around and around in, you know, just outside of the lower atmospheres. And, you know, when you put on night vision goggles, you can see more shooting stars and, space trash and all these other things that you wouldn't normally see on the naked eye. And so, yeah. but, but my personal opinion is no, I have never experienced that. And I remain 100% skeptical. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm still very skeptical. I mean, I'm always asking myself like, 
if these aliens are so smart, why do they let us even see them? Like if, if the technology was that good, right. we would never even see them to begin with. And number, number two, what are they, I mean, why would they, you know, mess around with us? It doesn't make any sense. But, but anyways, I, I just wanted to ask you that question. So Colonel, let me ask you one or two more questions and then I'll let you go. Cause I know we're bumping up against our time, but uh, let me just ask you as, as, as somebody in a leadership position, who's been a leader their entire life, who leads 900 plus men and women who have a very important job for our country. What are you telling people? What are your kind of thoughts? What, what are your beliefs about uh, how we get through this very, very difficult time in our country with the pandemic? And, and there's been a lot of uh, issues with race relations and things like that. And then of course the politics is very, very difficult right now. So what are you telling your, your folks, your family and the people that you work with about how we get through this. So Brian, I, I'm glad you asked. I think this is a good way to kind of conclude. And I've, I've got several things to talk about. So feel free to stop me and I'll expand or I'll just keep going. But, you know, for me, one of the funniest memes I've seen thus far is that 2020 is what Y2K was supposed to be. <laughs> I don't think there's any way that you could probably put it any more succinct. But, yeah. you know, the first thing that I, that I like to tell folks, Brian, is, you know, test yourself, right? Whether physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, you have to constantly test yourself because I truly believe that that makes you a better person. Um, you know, whether that be working out, I know that, I guess you just started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I did. I started in January and it's totally addictive, but man, it's not easy. It wasn't easy walking in there as a 47 year old man. Yeah. Self. Dude, I, so I've been on the mats for about 11 years now. That'd be really it. awesome. Yeah, love awesome. it. Man. I love it's it. So it's, cool, isn't it? I love it. Yeah. You know, or, or if it's CrossFit, it's competitions, it's testing yourself. In, yeah. in, in, you know, when we were younger, I was more into like testing myself against somebody else. But now I just want to see where I'm at mentally. What is my mental state? And, and I truly believe that that builds a stronger person. Um, you know, testing yourself meaningful dialogue kind of like we're doing or debating somebody on a topic you know i think that that's something that's kind of gone by the wayside is man it is okay to have differing opinions come in and debate and talk about it and maybe you know be open to listening and who knows man you maybe learn something um love that love that i also no. believe that for forcing yourself to do something that you don't like to do <laughs> is healthy man experience discomfort whether that's like jumping into a cold swimming pool or just, or doing, you know. Did you jump in my brain a couple of weeks ago and steal all my thoughts? I mean, I'm, you're literally, I love all this stuff. <laughs> oh, man, I, I tell you, you know, or being a 47 year old man and walking into a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym and getting beat up, you know, that is experiencing discomfort. But I got my butt so badly whipped the first time by a guy that I weighed by two, by probably, I'm 200, roughly 205. He probably weighed 150 and he was 50 years old and I, I just stood no chance, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> it is the most humbling experience that you can. So humbling. Yeah, so and humbling. Think, Dude, I really got this licked and then you get smoked. And you're yeah. like, wow, <laughs> I don't know what just happened, but it didn't work out well for me. So that's kind of the first thing. You know, I also think, Brian, what I've, what I've really started to, to talk to folks about, especially that work for me and some of my commanders is strategic patience, man. I mean, we as a society, I think, have become impatient and i really think that to make substantive change it takes time i mean look back when our country was founded dude july 4th of 1776 we declared independence it was not until january of 1791 before we actually ratified the entire constitution. Wow. So that's a long I'm a lawyer. Time. I did not know that. I'm I, I did not know that and I'm a lawyer. I shouldn't I should know better, but that's a really yeah, interesting story. Really. 14 interesting. and a half years. You yeah. know, and we were in a provisional government. We had the Articles of the Confederation, then we had the government of the Confederation, and it took a long time before we got to this thing that we call the Constitution, which is now, you know, really it's the oldest surviving written charter of government that yeah. we know. Yep. you know, since kind of recorded history. And you know, it, it really, it survived a civil war, economic depressions, assassinations by presidents, terrorist attacks. Yep. But it's, it's that we, the people, you know, those first three words, man, they're powerful. Yep. You know, and if you've had the opportunity um, to set foot in some of the places 
that, that I've been, and I know that you've experienced these same things. You know, you look at like Yemen and Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Djibouti, and I've had the opportunity to visit all these places on the ground and, and get to know the culture. It, it, you know, and I've lived in South Korea and I've lived in Germany. And I'll tell you, there is no other country like ours on the planet, period. Yeah. yeah. And dude, I mean, I got it. We are not without our problems. We are not without our flaws. But I really believe that, you know, if you, in, if you believe in the Constitution and allow it to do what it does, um, to be a guide and a protector, then, then I think, man, we are in a good spot we are in a good spot. Um, so that's, that's kind of my strategic patient speech. Um, you know, when it goes to leadership, right, you know, we lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, who I truly believe was an amazing American hero and a champion of rights for all. You know, and she, one thing that you know, she said I, was- I interrupt you, Colonel Gallimore, but one yeah. thing I just want to interject because I, I totally agree with you, but a lot of people don't know that her and Antonin Scalia, who were com on completely different sides of the political spectrum, were great friends, fast Excellent. friends. They were fast Excellent. friends. And, and I've been wondering, like, when did it become the rule in the country that if I disagree with you on something politically, all of a sudden you become my enemy? I mean, that's crazy talk, right? No, 100%. And, and that kind of goes back to that meaningful dialogue and debate. And it's okay to, to have differing opinions. It's healthy. Absolutely. Dude, we're a bunch of robots, man. It's Yeah. yeah. It's, you know what? One of my favorite things in the world is, is to find out I was wrong about something because I feel like if I find out I was thinking wrongly about something and I change my mind, then I can maybe get a little closer to the, you know, being better about the way I think. I like being, I, I like being told, Hey, you're wrong about this. And then going, you know what? You're right. I am wrong about this. I that's right. Yeah. Test my hypothesis. Please. Yeah. yeah. My assumptions. Yeah. I, hands down, man. I, you know, you, what, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said was fight for things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And I think that goes, and I had a chance to talk with Justice Scalia when I was going through the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. What a fascinating individual. Fascinating, fascinating guy. Fascinating and, guy. And he talked about him, about his relationship with um, RBG, you know, the notorious. <laughs> and it was just What's that? I'll tell you a funny story about Antonin Scalia. So I, I got a chance to, to meet him uh, a, a couple of times too. But anyways, a friend of mine was telling me a story. He was, you know, he was very, very famous in uh, legal circles and he was sitting around with like nine law students one time and he, he smoked cigarettes. And so he, my friend said he, he pulled out a cigarette and immediately all nine people pulled out a lighter to try to light a cigarette first. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. such an icon, you know, and probably none of those people smoked. They just brought a cigarette lighter just specifically for him, but, but a true titan, a true titan. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and that's it, man. And, and I really think if you look at Justice Scalia and you look at Justice Ginsburg, I mean, that they were willing to challenge assumptions, but they also had strategic patience and they, they championed causes in a way that made people want to join that cause with them, whatever it is. And I think that's the key. And so as opposed to ostracizing and alienating people, they really championed causes in a way where they fomented this support. And it was, yeah, I don't know, man. It, it, special people, both of them, very yep. special. Agree you know, 100%. The other piece of that puzzle, Brian, is the power of positive thinking. You know, I, I, I can't say it enough now be realistic, yeah. but be positive. You know, there is enough negativity floating around in this society um, that that's the last thing we need. You know, I think surround yourself with people who are, you know, willing to challenge your assumption, assumptions, test your hypothesis. They make you grow as a person, right? And just like yeah. you alluded to a minute ago, you know, being able to say that, wow, I just learned something, that's key, man. That, that and it kind of goes back to the very first thing that we were talking about developing relationships and then communicating effectively. Right. I mean, no better way than to just realize that, wow, man, I, I was proven wrong. And, you know, one uh, of my favorite sayings about that Colonel is I, I like to tell people I have strong opinions loosely held. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. You know, yeah, please. I, I love it when people prove me wrong yeah. and then I go back and look and go, man, how did I, what made me believe that, my incorrect opinion before, or how did I get to that assumption? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking about being positive. I wrote an article a number of years ago about uh, having a positive mindset versus having a, maybe a negative mindset. And 
you know, I've always tried to have a real positive mindset about things. And kind of the point of the article was, hey, man, why would you have, I mean, you want to go have a negative, uh, you know, mindset about things. That doesn't seem like a very fun way to live your life. Like, at the very least, if you have a po- positive but realistic, like not Pollyannish or something like that, but right. positive, realistic, it's just a much more pleasant way to go about life, right? So if you can choose to have a positive or negative mindset, I don't see why anybody, any rational human being would ever choose anything but being positive about stuff. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Brian. You know, and then the the other thing that I really believe in in this, and I've I've been lucky in my 20 plus years now in the air force and you know, the world is vast and it's full of really amazingly smart individuals who only want the best for themselves, their countries and their families. I I encourage everybody to live abroad. If you can, at least once study abroad. I want my daughters to study abroad. I think it's, you know, just being able to open the lens with which you view the world um, in a more broad manner only allows kind of true freedom of thought. And I, and I believe more purposeful meaning in life. Nice. Nice. Well, 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 Colonel John B. Nuke Gallimore, you <laughs> literally have leadership coming out of every single pore in your body. You are absolutely one of the most perfect guest I could, I could imagine, I, you know, listening to you and, and talking to you and seeing you, I, I think uh, gives me certain feelings that I think it gives a lot of people. And that's trust and faith in our country and our military. And, and the fact that we have people of such high caliber, uh, of such good faith, intelligence, of such good morals and ethics, uh, literally who have devoted their entire adult life to serving an emphasis on the word serving our country and protecting our country. Uh, you, you are just the epitome, uh, literally the epitome of what my, at least my idea of leadership is. You're also an American patriot. You're a war hero and you're just a great guy. So Colonel Gallimore, and you're also very busy. So I appreciate all your time. Colonel Gallimore, I, I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed you being on the podcast. I cannot tell you how much I looked up. I look up to you as a leader, a positive leader, and, and you're just a great guy. So man, Colonel, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And next time uh, you're in Texas, man, or I'm in Nevada, let's maybe try to get together if we have some time. Brian, I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time to, to allow me to say a few things. And it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to wear this uniform now for 21 years and counting. And, and thanks for what you do. And I appreciate you allowing me to communicate the story and definitely look forward to catching up uh, at some point. Aggie football game, if we ever get back on the field and uh, get that man, gig him. There you go. Gig him right back at you, Colonel. Hey, Brian Beckham here. I hope you really liked the latest episodes of Lessons from Leaders. I really, really appreciate all the thousands and thousands of people that have commented, that have listened, that have subscribed, that have seen the shows. And if you're liking the show, it would really, really help me and all the guests if you would give it a rating, if you would subscribe, if you would comment and share on it. The algorithms that run the uh, underlying platform, like I've talked about earlier, really like that. And so I'm not getting paid for this. The people that are on the show are not getting paid for this. We're doing this for one reason. We're doing this to spread some positive leadership, some positive stories, some fun stories out in the world. We've got far too much fighting going on right now. And so Lessons from Leaders is designed to focus on basically 100% positive leadership. And so if you're liking the show, if you want me to keep doing it, if you want me to keep getting good guests, boy, I would really, really appreciate it if you could like, comment, share, subscribe do all those things so the podcast algorithms will continue to serve it up and more people will see it and hopefully my guests and their views will have an even wider impact on the world than they already have. So anyway, thank you very much and on to the next episode.